So I'm John Smith, and I'm a research scientist and fellow at IBM TJ Watson Research Center. And in the next uh, hour or so, uh, we will have a panel that will continue to, to explore this Discovery Technology Foundations, but with a view towards open science. So it's really about picking up on some of the points that Alessandro uh, talked about in terms of accelerating, so going faster. Can we also do some things as a community to scale up and scale out? So by scale up, I mean translate faster to impact in many of the problem areas that Alessandro talked about. And can we scale out? So can we address more problems uh, together as we work as a, as a community? So that's really the launching point for, for this panel. And let me just you know, get started again you know, with a little bit of, of the context. So we have this um, you know, great hypothesis uh, today that uh, we are indeed entering a new era of accelerated di discovery. And in many ways, this is being enabled by changes that we're seeing in information technology, uh, but also as we build services on top of all of that, uh, which really can allow scientists and developers to go faster. So, Taking that as a premise, and we know in some applications, we can certainly uh, really make great impact on, on the pace of scientific discovery. So now on this panel, what we want to explore is how do we build uh, capacity among the scientists and as a community to take these kinds of capabilities and address problems in, in a much more scaled way. And the, the panelists we've assembled today are bringing really a, a, an excellent complement of background and expertise and skills to help us explore further here. But let me just put a few of the dimensions you know, on, on the table before I introduce the, the panelists. So one, the context is really this uh, working as, as communities of discovery. And the whole idea is that uh, together as, as a broader community, we can share our interests and our skills, our expertise, but also resources and the infrastructure. And, and in doing so, uh, we can address more problems and, and make even uh, bigger impacts. And what we really want to explore here on the panel is, well, what are the sets of um, collaborations that we should foster? How do we work through partnerships and, and open communities? Uh, on one hand, we, we could say science has always been a team sport. But how can we uh, do better by enabling uh, them through, through infrastructure? Uh, also, what is the role of data in open data uh, or uh, tools and, and code, open source in the context of, of science? And uh, last is about infrastructure. What kinds of resources can we make available, open resources, uh, through cloud or you know, other means that can enable these communities of discovery to, to make their impact at a bigger scale. So that's the introduction to the panel topics. Uh, let me, you know, now before I turn it over to our individual panelists, uh, introduce them uh, one by one. So again, my name is uh, John Smith and I'm a research scientist at IBM. And today I'll be joined by uh, Dr. Ahmet Erdemir. And uh, Ahmet is from the Cleveland Clinic where he is the director of computational uh, biomodeling. And he also leads the Erdemir uh, Laboratory, which is um, part of the uh, you know, very significant Learner Research Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. So Ahmed will be giving us a you know, very strong perspective within a particular uh, problem domain and, and domain of science. I'll be joined also by Alexei uh, Krabov. And Alexei comes from a different perspective. He has a long history of organizing communities around problems. He has organized the Scale by the Bay and other Bay Area meetups, including uh, SF Scala, SF Spark, uh, Bay Area AI. And he's quite busy also this week with uh, a lot of activities at the SciPy uh, conference. So Alexei is currently an open source Science Community Director at IBM Research in Accelerated Discovery. So we're really looking forward to his point of view. And then last, but definitely not least, we're joined by 
uh, Ernesto Damiani, and you may know him for all he's doing to help organize uh, the event this year here. And he's also a full professor at uh, University uh, Degli Studi di, di Milano and senior director of Robotics and Intelligent Systems Institute and director for the Center of Cyber-Physical Systems at uh, Khalifa University. And he has a long uh, experience around problems of uh, computation and cloud and security. So he definitely brings an important complementary perspective. So I think with that introduction, you know, now I will turn it over to our panelists. They will each deliver a few minutes of uh, perspective of, of their view on the opportunities around uh, open approaches in, in science. Uh, then we'll get to some questions and some of the questions will be seated by, by me, but we will also be looking for any questions that may come from the, the audience. So, okay, with that, let me turn it over to a Dr. Erdemir. Thank you very much, John. And it would have been great to be with you like there, but you know, this virtual meeting is also a good option as well too. And it's great to be in this panel. And I just wanted to, you know, tell you a little bit about my experiences and like, you know, that really kind of at least convinces me and my lab and many of us like at Cleveland Clinic, like why we need to invest in, you know, accelerated discovery, why we need to invest in like openness. So we are in physics-based modeling business. We, and whatever I say is usually uses the knee as an example, but it applies to any organ, any disease. And I'm hinging it towards mechanistic modeling where we can put like anatomical properties, material properties, other model inputs. And we really wanted to get, you know, the predict mechanics, right? And, you know, this has been done in other domains, particularly in, you know, manufacturing industry, you know, for planes, trains. And we really wanted to, you know, focus on how we can scale the utilization of physics-based modeling, you know, for decision-making in biomedical research and healthcare. And those decisions can help us to generate new scientific knowledge, new discoveries, but help us like to help patients and even to do it in a patient specific manner for diagnosis. Right. But really there are a lot of things are involved when we want to do a simulation study. We start of course, like, you know, traditionally with a hypothesis that might define a context of use and that all like trickles down to some data that we need to curate, like to build models, calibrate them, benchmark them. And in, in the end, we really wanted to use those models like to, you know, for discovery and for clinical care, like in our case too. And the problem is this infrastructure and the life cycle is very uh, fragmented in our world. Like we use a variety of software and hardware like simulation software or like you know programming uh strategies but we rely on different types of data models standard operating procedures literature and we are always doing it in an ad hoc fashion too like to get those simulations and while we are doing this we also generate a lot of what i call like derivative data you know you transform the raw data, like let's say clinical images or like any kind of physiological signals into components of the models. And as you do those transformations, there might be intermediate products like geometries that of the anatomy uh, organs or, you know, some simulation results can be generated. And in the end, this can always like leads into new knowledge that we publish in a sense, right? But if, you know, we also like pay attention to some openness and transparency in terms of capturing this whole life cycle, then it really provides opportunities for anyone in the future to be able to enter these workflows in any time points like in their life cycle too, right? And they can be used as a training purpose, but they can also be used like to reproduce the work done or like to transfer whatever is work done to other domains by examples. And, but then, you know, simply by the fact that we are right now confined with traditional ways of doing science and also uh, communicating science like we are like faced with challenges and as we are also doing all those modeling ad hoc and recently we did some 
you know, in-depth examination of nine seminal simulation studies in computational knee biomechanics. And really what we looked at was fairly simple, right? We looked at if the, you know, those studies were reported well, like what was the completeness of reporting? And as we review those studies, like we realized that maybe those studies are at best, like, you know, reported like 50% level of completeness. That really pinpoints a problem because it really gets towards the reproducibility challenge, you know, because even if the reporting is complete or like all the, you know, other assets are there, reproducing a study like might be like challenging in itself. And hence our belief, like, you know, based on our examination of any of those studies to be reproduced is like, you know, maybe at 30%. And we look at different levels of models too, like not just, you know, how a model is built, but how it might be validated. And this is the challenge that really prevents us to scale up and also before even we scale up, how we can like translate those models in a believable, credible manner to practice. And that's like one of the reasons and I'm going to list like, you know, why we might actually leverage technology and openness together, like to really push particularly simulation based studies or even like data driven approaches, like including machine learning and AI, like to really extract knowledge and discoveries, but also translated the field because we really need integrated environments like for accelerated discovery. But, you know, when these, you know, environments are there, they also provide the opportunity for examination and that might come with openness. And examination is, you know, really an important part, like, you know, of establishing the trust into whatever like analysis that has been done or that might have been done like for future in future for the patients to and pass her part of the regulatory process and for anybody to be able to review you know what is done and the openness should be there like at least for those people and this really like leads towards like translation in the end too like you know taking generating the new knowledge in an open manner but how to pass it through regulation and then later like having translated like in the field too but we firmly believe that and based on our analysis and our experiences that scholarly publication as a knowledge transfer medium is severely limited. And I don't think like we can even, you know, even for simple studies, we cannot capture the completeness or the essence of the study in a way that can be reproduced or in a way that can be believed like, you know, well in scholarly publication. And that really also, you know, brought like in the past decade like how we might need to make our data fair like findable accessible interoperable and reusable but i would like to actually have us think like beyond just making data fair or beyond just making publications like accessible too but anything in between platforms workflows data models knowledge should be you know at least being able to examine and they may be like used in future like you know and that will require their interoperability as well too so i'm going to stop in here and i will looking forward to our discussions in many of these areas okay thank you Ahmed. okay next up will be alexi uh, hello everybody thank you john um it's great to be uh here virtually with uh fellow panelists uh, in Barcelona um, and um, following Alessandro's talk, uh, I think it's really fitting that um, we talk about communities and, and, um, and science. So first of all, you know, if we observe, uh, everybody is very happy to be together, right? At the live conference and even, you know, some of us are coming still remotely, we are able to, to meet. And I think that talks to the main engine um, of, of both science and um, um, computer science communities that people really want to do discovery and uh, technology together, right? And I think we, we take it for granted, we used to take it for granted, but during COVID, everybody experienced um, how valuable it is, right? And um, an example I, I can give from my recent experiences, right, we've been for maybe two years on Zooms, and so, um, my local IBM lab, Alma then reopened and I visited my friends there and uh, maybe spent about four hours uh, talking about uh, materials and 
uh, material discovery as a computer scientist, you know, I'm learning from, from my colleagues there. And in, in those four hours, I would say I was able to pack maybe 20 or 30 hours of Zoom, right? Because we could have coffee with fellow scientists. We can walk around the building, which scientists do, right? Some people really enjoy thinking and talking while walking, right? And you can really, you can observe the laboratory and, and so forth. So you can achieve, I think, in, in, the, in the community setting, right? The, the diversity and variety of collaborations are much broader uh, than in the individual setting or, you know, what we experience on Zoom. So I think that that's an example of what community gives. Community consists of many things. Some of them are tangible. Some of them are intangible that those collaborations and modes really make things tick, right? So um, I think it's important right now that we consider uh, how people uh, collaborate. So um, from my personal experience, uh, uh, I came to Silicon Valley after I finished my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania more than 10 years ago. And I found a unique landscape where uh, basically the global internet industry is built, right? The major innovation is coming from here. And the modes of learning has to adapt to the kind of knowledge being developed. They, they, they're not teaching this in school. Even now, if you look at the cutting edge advances in AI, distributed systems, DevOps, right? There is a combination of, of tools which make modern internet and AI work at a global scale. And generally, you can only do it, learn it by doing, right? So uh, a new kind of um, apprenticeship system uh, appeared where uh, top companies build these global distributed systems and they usually have research labs because this is really advanced knowledge, but you, you learn it through a kind of diffusion. You, you don't learn it through a hierarchical system which was traditionally established, right? We have over the thousand of years of the university, right? Uh, the kind of uh, formalized knowledge which takes some time to settle. There is no time now for these systems to to, to percolate knowledge through these established ways, what happens is uh, people meet, people kind of um, organ, self-organize in these networks of knowledge. And so in, in uh, the Bay Area, uh, they actually organize around the meetups, right? So when I came about 10 years ago, there were already 5,000 different meetups. And so we have about the same number if you pick a topic such as big data. Right, you will find that people organize around technologies, they organize around DevOps, they organize around machine learning and data mining, information retrieval. They also organize around their domains. So you would find things like big data for lawyers, right? Uh, and uh, everybody feels that <clears throat> they need to learn this way. And so what happens is that people meet after work, usually uh, companies are eager to provide them space uh, because uh, there is a shortage of uh, specialists with this kind of knowledge. So everybody's eager to meet uh, the scientists, the software engineers, and hire them. So uh, over 10 years, I hosted maybe hundreds of physical meetups when we used to have them. Hopefully, we'll have them again, right? And most companies open their doors. They, they really want folks to come, and they share kind of their uh, advanced work, uh, usually it is uh, machine learning enhanced by powerful distributed infrastructure. So companies like Uber uh, and uh, uh, everybody engages in discussion, right? So I think that is similar to scientific knowledge sharing, but in, in some ways it is different. And I think the, uh, the call of the times now is that to leverage what we learned in this rapid cycle of innovation uh, in computer science and bring it to the traditional science, right? So each of the areas has its, its strengths uh, the, that now can complement each other. And so as coming from uh, the, the community side, uh, I can uh, list a few of the strengths um, which emerge from the community. First of all, it's, it's also merit-based and knowledge-based. There is a very simple metric, right? If something is true or not, it works at global scale and it makes money. Right. This is so. This is pedestrian, but you know, in in some way, ultimately, there is a metric of success. So the, 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 the distributed system is doing 
uh, the work which was it was intended to do and the result of metrics, right? All of these uh, companies, their products are data-driven, they have analytics, they have feedback loops, they observe what users want to do, and they, they basically measure if the next version is better than the previous one. And um, right, so, so there is a very clear metric of success and everybody is contributing to it. And, uh, and so the, the trust of uh, somebody who will share their knowledge can be easily checked, right? If somebody is leading a group in, a, in, in this company which you can observe, right? You know that, that they build something which works. So that's, I think it's very, it's very important, right? That the knowledge is translated into code, which is operational, which is running. And most of it is now powered by open source. What happened is, you know, software is in the world, uh, the world's market is recent, but open source software is eating regular software. Most of the systems which we enjoy are open source based. And uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, IBM, uh, I think is the, the foundation of this. A lot of folks maybe now take it for granted by we have the internet because we have the distributed data center, which is powered by Linux and IBM contributed key uh, IP to Linux early on, which made this revolution possible. Also, things like Java and programming languages, all of them are open source. We don't have closed source compilers anymore in widespread use, right? And, and so that is powering the software lay layer right now on top of this. Um, another point I wanted to make is that a lot of challenges which are facing uh, scientists, uh, and Ahmed uh, mentioned some of them, such as reproducible science, they're actually solved problems in software engineering. So I come from the functional programming uh, background, languages like Haskell, Scala, Clojure, or Camel. Uh, a lot of them uh, veer into theoretical computer science uh, and um, kind of proof uh, of correctness and so uh, they come with features inherently suitable for reproducibility. So the, immu the immutable, right? So the reentrant uh, and a refreshing transparent. If you have a function which you know takes input and output does not have a state, it will also produce the same result. So there is a whole discipline where reproducibility is a need, is a must, right? If you need to develop uh, systems at scale, you need a way to reason about them, and so. Uh, a lot of effort which went into building these distributed systems and proving that they're correct and observing and debugging them is the same that is required to build a reproducible infrastructure. So um, uh, if, if you look at what developers in this area use, they can reproduce everything. They can reproduce infrastructure as code, right? So they can build clusters from descriptions. They can also uh, reproduce their own environments. And now we're moving to the times when the environments are in the cloud and uh, they can be completely reproduced. Your shell, your command history can be completely reproduced. So the, the challenge of reproducible science is that we can basically uh, uh, take what we know and socialize it, make it usable for scientists. Uh, and so this is, I think, uh, the promise that we have now is to merge the knowledge in, um, in, in community uh, right, we established uh, a knowledge in science. I think this is what uh, uh, what we need to do. We need to uh, to cross pollinate and, and share this knowledge. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Alexi. All right, Ernesto, over to you. Thank you very much. May you get to the yeah. okay. So, thank you very much. And I have a, a, just a, a couple of well, a few slides, but the slides are here just to show why I really wanted to be on this path. And so this is the reason. And the reason why I really wanted to be on this panel, and I'm learning a lot, both from the previous wonderful talk that we had, the keynote talk, and also here, because I am the PI of this thing, which is called Musa. You know, Musa is the Italian version of the name of those Greek pagan demigodes, uh, and they help the people to produce art, you know, so music or something, not only by inspiring them, but also by providing them with some sort of techniques, for example, how to write the music, how to do the data representation that was most suitable for that particular discipline. So basically, what we are trying here to do in this particular infrastructure is to set up an architecture where we can do 
uh, this type of size, the type of size that was mentioned before at the beginning. Of course, um, I will try to, to give a, a, a little bit of an idea. Uh, we are focusing on some, on a specific area, which is the area, I would call it, of life sciences, because this is the vocational part. These are large scale projects that are basically being started this September. So wish me good luck because I will be leading this one. So, but I think I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's important to comment also in terms of what can our community contribute to the vision that uh, was put forward in the keynote and uh, we are discussing here in this panel. What we can contribute, I don't know if I, I will manage to actually move the slides and progress. So <laughs> I'm trying, all the, okay, here we are. So basically the notion is that a lot of the uh, inference and whether it's traditional inference, so it is partly automated inference uh, on, uh, um, uh, that is part of the scientific process will be carried out on digital data, on digital form. And when I say, uh, I see, you know, a sort of a, a blurred distinction between traditional, meaning in which features, in which all the different parameters of the, of the pi digital pipeline are set by humans, and the humans have a reason to do so and have a theory behind that, and the moment in which you will have fuller autonomy, like in the splendid keynote we had, you are see, we are seeing even hyperparameters to be sort of learned, you know, and, uh, and in the end you will have automated science. So it's a panoply of techniques and let's start today from the notion that even traditional uh, models are mostly applied, the inference is mostly done, whether it's classification, whether it's prediction, is mostly done in on digitalized form. And in order to sort of make it faster and make it more productive and make it more efficient, you must enable this type of uh, things to become generalized practice. So of course it can be done locally and anecdotally by each individual research group, by each individual hospital, by each individual uh, drug design lab. But if you want to generalize it, you, mu you must have this type of uh, uh, general uh, architecture standardization. This is what we are trying to, to build. So let me go to the next slide. So basically the idea here is that we wanted to have multiple technologies to converge. The technologies, first of all, the edge, the data digitization, the interface between the real world and the digitized world. All this also requires artificial intelligence and requires help to be done. And we want to do it. We want to do the edge on premises. We want to do the edge on network to be able to put in the data into the architecture. Secondly, we wanted to mix with the services on the data themselves. There is something that wasn't mentioned. Oh, it was mentioned a little bit in the keynote, which is, well, how hard it is to have this type of rich representations. Sometimes they are mixed data, metadata. The metadata needs to be there. They need to be good quality. They need to be interoperable among the different moments in which they are taken in. So there's a lot of hard color, blue color work to be done before we can get to the perspective of automated science. And we wanted to help people to do this blue collar work and to reuse the work done by the others. And the thirdly, there is the collaboration. Collaboration means that I want to do compositional studies. I wanted to take your results and they become my inputs. And this is also something that our community can help to do. Well, we, we are here because we should be experts in, pro in compositional processes, composing processes, composing pipelines, composing data-driven applications. So I go to the next one. There is also an educational perspective. I mean, as a university person, the people who will do this type of science will not be the same people that did the traditional one. And we, we already are mentioning transdisciplinary degrees. And for example, there's a Cleveland Clinics. I know several of those MDs from Cleveland Clinics. We have one in Abu Dhabi, so I have a, a sort of a, a frequent collaboration with them. And those MDs are actually also have a degree in data science and we have transdisciplinary people who can understand i mean and uh, do the this type of uh, uh, science uh, new type of, uh, of paradigm i don't want to bore you too much let me see go to the final slides so i told you we need we can provide we can offer our competence on the service platforms we can offer our competence on the communication networks i don't mention security which is very important and also the Pro big problem of the data ownership and the, the data, the IP. But we can offer our expertise to do this type of automated science. So let me go to the next slide if someone helps me to do that because I'm trying to point the clicker. Okay, so these are the pillars, I think. First of all, automating the real world, the digitized world interface. 
I just give you one quick example. We have uh, automate is ma we have mice where you put in stem cells, and then basically you have to extract and digitize the DNA, chimeric DNA of the stem cells that are in put into the mice. This operation is not standard at all. It requires control of the edge of the wet lab to an in vivo to to the to the digitized part. And if you want to do good automated science, you must be able to provide the quality there. Then you have to be able to, uh, I mean, move these data or move the models to the data. But more, most of the times it will be the second thing. And thirdly, you need to, to be able to extract and share the, the conclusions that someone else may use as auxiliary information for some uh, uh, additional process. So these are the pillars. We want to provide a way to it will be tailor-made. We don't think that the edge part can be easily automated today. What we are, I think also that uh, what is closest to automation is the pipeline after digitization. And that, that for that one, uh, of course, uh, we are closer to uh, the, 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 at least the semi-automatic turning the knobs would be already a big pro progress with respect to, uh, you know, one by one anecdotal studies. Okay, let me move ahead. Okay, I, I, these are the physical places where we are going to build this, but uh, I don't think you know, that that's the periphery of Milan where the Expo 2015. So that's a big quarter, and that one will be the place where we will have most of our, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the wet lab to digitalized uh, interface. Okay, okay, so this is a technology strategy, and for this technology strategy, we need the partners, of course. The technology strategy means that we are moving from the traditional anecdotal model. And again, I don't say that we want to automate the science inference from tomorrow. I'm saying that all the larger scale research ecosystems in Europe will have to move away from the traditional anecdotal research uh, and development to this, which I call open science. And let me recognize this. Uh, I, don't want, I finish on this note. That this is only possible because the software is open source. If we had to pay a license and to build the infrastructure, that wouldn't be possible. The only reason why we can dream of this is that someone has prepared open line pipelines or at least the component of the open line pipelines, and we can use them. With even sometimes with the help of the people who prepared them and and uh, proposed them, so I I think here we have really the new frontier of academia and industry collaboration. We wouldn't be able to do that development ourselves, but we are able to produce the research that it, uh, relies on that development. Okay, so I think I'm finished. Let me go to the final slide. Okay, I don't. This is the calendar. Sorry, but I don't want to show it to you. Where will we be in five years? Well, it's up to everybody. It's up to IBM, it's up to the other industry collaborators that we are going to recruit for these projects. It is uh, up to us, most of all. And maybe we will go in to, uh, we will reach a level in which we could uh, do this type of automated open science that we were discussing. Maybe we will simply get more productivity. Well, fine. I, I'd settle for this anytime. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ernesto, and thank you to all of the panelists. As you can see, it's a truly high-powered panel, um, but let's really get into it. Uh, here. So um, you all mentioned the open and the need to be open, but, um, but why? Why is open needed? And what does open mean in full in science? How is it different from what we've already done with open source or, or data? So um, Ahmed, why don't I start with you? So coming from the Cleveland Clinic, well, already one of the premier hospitals uh, that we know, um, why, why is open so important for the work you do? I, I will give you my anecdote and how I'm a, like, you know, openness, you know, advocates. Like, you know, when I was doing my master's thesis in Turkey, you know, in my native country, I just needed a data to build a model. I didn't have the means to collect the data. And I actually sent an email to a list server where biomechanics people around the time that congregates, like that was about five, 700 people at the time. And, you know, I got data from an investigator from 
Italy, you know, Institute of Rizzoli, like in Bologna. And that actually, like, you know, said my master's thesis, right? And it was, yeah, and I was sold. And years later, like, and when we are building knee joint models for multi-scale modeling, and this was like, you know, 20 years later, right? And and I look at, you know, I wonder, like everybody builds knee joint models. We see those papers all around. I wonder if there's anything that I can use, download and use. And and because this is the content, you know, there is the open hardware, open software, but there's also you need content to be able to play around with. And I didn't find, and to me, that's essentially a sign of research waste because you can find a lot of new joint models that are published, maybe on the order of hundreds. We say that, you know, every biomechanist has their new joint model. But, you know, I built one, you know, for my lab too. But the difference that we made was that we actually disseminated at the time, like as a free and open source new joint model. And that's actually how we start to break the cultural barriers to openness a little bit. And that actually gives my lab department and my laboratory really great visibility and provided collaboration opportunities. Then, you know, it really kind of removed some borders. But of course, like throughout the years, we also like, you know, face the challenges to openness too, because we all like understand the economic value of hardware, software, data, models. But then how can we navigate and shape our business model as scientists we have business models too believe it or not and shape our business models in a way that we can benefit you know almost like both tracks of getting things in the hands of people that can do really creative things right you know and then it can be through commercialization but you know open source or openness is another way to get things in the hands of people sometimes earlier and faster so i will stop there <laughs> Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Ahmed. Uh, uh, Alexi, you know, building on that a little bit more, um, you know, Ahmed gave some, you know, great examples of uh, openness when it comes to data and helping to to scale the efforts in, in, in science. He also mentioned in the beginning the concepts like FAIR uh, approaches to, to data, which can be important in, in science. How far can we go with this notion of, of FAIR? Does it apply beyond data? And um, if so, to, to, to what? Is there a notion of FAIR experiments or FAIR workflows? Or, um, or you know, what does it mean to do open source science? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, and, and thanks, Ahmed, for um, um, starting this perspective. Um, I think uh, now we have this driving force, right? So first of all, we have two personas merging in this um, open source science revolution. We have the research software engineer. I think the term is now kind of solidifying. You can see it mentioned. You can see jobs on the RSE, right? The research software engineer. And you see the scientists. And sometimes facetious, I use this analogy from the Chronicles of Narnia. If you remember, there is a kid and there is a daemon. They're inseparable, right? They live in symbiosis. You cannot separate them. They will both die. So this is very similar to what is happening. We have scientists who are inherently using computational tools, computational workflows, right? They're domain experts. They lead with the expertise, right? As, as Ernesto showed, as Ahmed showed, you need to know the human body. You need to model, right? This is a very important domain. You cannot just read it in a text file, right? It's not a read me. You need to go to school to do this. So, so the traditional discipline exists, but this is more into digital twins, which Sharon has to mention. Right now, you need all this machinery. And so now, now you basically get all this culture of, of software engineering, which, which evolved as taking openness for granted. So first of all, if a scientist has to take full advantage of RSE, a lie, right? So they both have distinct roles, but now they have to learn to work in the symbiosis, right? And now the next generation may evolve, which are both, right? But for now, I think it's fair to say, it's very rare to see somebody who is excellent in both domains. You know, somebody is either an excellent great scientist or an excellent great, an excellent engineer, and you need both, right? So you need to, to share this knowledge, but you need both. And so the in order to basically make the most of the engineering allies, you really need to adapt to the way they work. And sometimes 
it's hard because some of the data is proprietary, right? Like, you know, a lot of pharma data, it takes years and the result of well. So, so there is a cultural change. It's hard to let go. And I encountered many science domains. It's, it's, uh, there is no immediate incentive to share data. Data is considered very valuable. So the natural instinct is to hoard the data, right? As in, and I think in biosciences, data is, is capital. So the, I think the, the hard question is how do we incentivize people to share data? And that I've, I've encountered several uses of this. So my alma mater, University of Pennsylvania, is one of the leading sites of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and autism using data mining. And so the, this data sets are very small, right? You cannot get more than 100 patients or so in each case. So what you need to do, you need to augment it, this data set. So you want to for instance, get Alzheimer patients are the same. They may speak Hebrew or Italian or Russian or Turkish, but the, the disease will progress similarly. So what you need to do this, and these folks are doing it from the ground up. They basically find collaborators around the world to augment their data sets, right? And they adopt their uh, natural language processing pipelines. Uh, that's the work of Professor McLibman to, to these all different languages because the, the patients exhibit their problems speaking to doctors, right? But now you need to join this data. Where can you join this data? Uh, somebody, uh, and I, I hope IBM will be a leader in this, uh, what the committee needs to, to, to help, right? Is somebody needs to build the secure data stores, which are both uh, uh, preserving privacy information, healthcare, medical records, but also less people collaborate. So I think what, what needs to happen, we need to think of this fair architecture which allows access to researchers while preserving key properties of the data required by kind of legal frameworks and privacy uh, information. And so I think that, uh, as, as computer scientists, we know we have multiple tools to do this, right? So we have, we have secure enclaves, we have a privacy preserving data mining, right? And so forth. So there is a lot of advances happening and, and we, we really need to bring them to bear right because now they're mostly used in ad tech right ad tech generates a lot of money and so there are regulatory requirements as gdpr so that drove a lot of advances in privacy preservation now we have to take these advances we have to bring them to bear on on healthcare on life sciences and right on on all of the other scientists so we we, uh, we need to take this these frameworks and i think there are computer science architectures uh, uh, which, which can be used to implement them. But I think this is where, where we really need to focus, right? How do we take these advances in, in proper data management, which allows for research, federated research, federated learning and so forth, and implement them at scale. And I think we have the technology, we need to have the will, and we need to socialize this, this in the community. And so our initiative called Open, open Source Science, which we are unveiling, Tomorrow um, at SciPy is one of the ways to kind of create working groups and interact groups which will do that, right? Which will um, connect the scientists and software engineers and think how do we take the technology and how to implement them to bear on data. Thanks, Alexi. So I think the effort you point to at SciPy is a really good example. Um, but building on this a little bit more, uh, Ernesto, you know, Alexi talks about incentives and uh, interests need to be aligned. And this indicates there may be some kind of bootstrapping <laughs> problem. And, you know, MindDT, you know, that you're working on is one way to, you know, galvanize a community around a problem set. More generally, how, how do we bootstrap here, <laughs> right? Because, you know, we may say open is good, but getting to open may still not be easy. Yeah, I, I think it's not easy. We, uh, also due to the fact that, that uh, we have been prevented from uh, uh, until now, not only because we didn't have the models, but also because the data were partitioned and shared in the wrong way. So meaning that data belonged to, to different uh, data owners, they were partitioned, they were fragmented. Uh, even when they were made public, uh, we saw uh, this uh, increasing literature of going back to the other literature to find to try to distillate the data out of the previous literature because it is something that is over it is not that easy to do and it, it, it's time wasting so we have this problem and i personally i want to sort of uh, uh, just in the interest of time provide a two seconds opinion i think that we have another option and the the, the option that we are having is not to share the data is to share the parameters 
I think that this is going to be uh, the paradigm. Uh, again, even sharing the parameters doesn't solve entirely the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, talking uh, only of federated learning. I'm talking of sharing something that is learned from the data rather than sharing the data themselves. And this is, I believe, part of the, of the vision here. Uh, I think that in order to do that, of course, you need guarantees. You need guarantees because still you could do some, you know, reverse engineering of these parameters that you exchange. But on the other hand, we have to create a marketplace uh, for free, an open marketplace where the collective knowledge can be shared. I don't think it can be the data for a number of reasons. This is just my two cents, including the normative reasons, which are very, very, uh, even if people wanted to, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. While I think that we should find, and I believe that this is architectures are really an opportunity to find alternative things to share, which are come from the data. And the federated learning is just, you know, a uh, tip of the iceberg. Everybody wants to do federated learning for, but the, really the reason what they are trying to do is to give us something that we can share. Okay, we will definitely come back to questions from the audience in, in a minute here. So, um, you know, just building on uh, this point here from Ernesto uh, and from the other panelists. Okay, so maybe, uh, data cannot be open everywhere and 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 for every body. So we can think of other ways of maybe offering derived products around uh, data. But we still have a, a challenge here in terms of compute and infrastructure, right? Because not everyone has the same resources to even work, you know, with with some of those uh, uh, downstream resources. So um, so none of you really mentioned so far too much yet around um, infrastructure and compute and um, what could potentially be open there. So maybe I'll start with, with Ahmed. Do, do you have any thoughts about um, how we can make computing more accessible and available and, and open in this space? Yeah, I, th I think you're hitting a good point, like John, like it's a, it's like we need to navigate as well too because we know that one size doesn't fit all and we it's everything is like almost like you know done on a project basis or like how we might actually then abstract that project phase is doing to scale up like i, I mean for our work like in you know mechanistic simulations like our infrastructures yeah we need computing architecture like from a hardware perspective sometimes high performance you know architectures but we also need you know, sometimes simulation software. And really, you know, if you think about it, in the alter, you know, in the most idealistic case, like if you have a workflow, you create a model, but if you cannot run that model, <laughs> then you don't have the software to run that model and you don't have the hardware to run that model, it's dead on arrival. So now the problem is then, how can we still provide an opportunity to learn something from that model? Because if you're providing this as an open source, the model, like it's a way of at least you can see the model architecture, right? So you might be able to reproduce it in your own hardware, in your own software. But then, you know, giving derivative data is also like, as you say, is an option too, like as, you know, things can scale, but can we even like provide opportunities that at least someone can try out some simulations, like repeat simulations, for example, in uh, uh, of you know, of some of the software. And we tried that in one of our like you know analysis, like how to combine reproducing simulations, like in you know in musculoskeletal modeling. And that was extremely challenging in the review process, even when we were using open source software that people can download and. The simulations could have been run in desktop but you know again those are i think like points out to another way of we need to think of the whole ecosystem basically that's what i'm trying to get at <laughs> okay thanks thanks Ahmed. i you know i wonder just building on uh this point a little bit more um so when we talk about any computing then we talk about the operating system you know or the platform on 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 top and 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 so on um and there are many examples historically around uh, open efforts like Linux and um, you know so much of what's happened in uh, the cloud space. And But what about science? So if we say in five years, um, will there be a Linux of scientific discovery? And um, 
what will it look like? So, Ernesto, maybe I'll start with you. Oh, thank you very much, but it's a very difficult question. So I hope the others will give you better answers. Okay, so let me say something. Certainly, another thing which I, when I said that the parameters, uh, I think that uh, part of this Linux of uh, research will need to be generative models. Generative models, so when I said we, the data will not be shared, meaning the, the, the original data, the seeds, those we cannot really easily share, but certainly we can share the parameters, and I want to add now, we can share uh, the, the outcome of generative or augmentation models. So I think that a part of the Linux of scientific discovery will be this one, will be the infrastructure over which you can exchange what can be exchanged which mm -hmm. are basically gener the generated data and the parameters that can be used for composition, model composition, or, mod or transfer learning. This is something that, in my opinion, is even more important than the HPC. Uh, let me say why. Uh, yeah, of course, the HPC is very important. We need to run the models. We need to compute those parameters. We need to generate those generative data. And uh, certainly, this part will need to be there, but it's already there. And we, for example, in Europe, we, you can access uh, this type of supercomputing power with very limited resources because it's funded by, it's funded by the, the research program. We have now in Europe nine large HPC centers all funded on European money in which the science can go. What we don't have is the facility or the sharing facility for the knowledge, which in my opinion is, as I said, synthetic data plus the parameters. Plus, maybe the hyperparameters, but Alessandro has gone away, so I, want, I don't want to compromise on this. This platform, this switching platform, is, in my opinion, even more important than the models themselves. Because the models themselves, yeah, we, we know how to run them on the HPC, and I think that uh, the good HPC support will not be scarce in the future. This is just my two cents, and uh, I admit it's debatable, but I would like the other panelists maybe to, to amend and provide the, the, their own answers. Yeah, no, great. Thanks, Ernesto. Okay, before we turn it over to some questions from the audience, I just want to give Alexi a chance to respond because I think we're really building towards something here. Um, so, Alexi, you know, the, the Linux of scientific discovery, how, how do we get started on something like that? Thank you, John. This is a, this is a great question, right? And so it's it's interesting that in um, in distributed systems, this notion happened about six years ago, seven years ago, with masses and Kubernetes, which they hailed as you know they even have this notion of data center operating system DCOS, right? Which lifted OS notion to the data center. And I think in in science, it's a combination, it's a techno social infrastructure, right? Because it's a communication. I think Ernesto really hit. Uh, the nail on the head that HPCs are cheap now. We can get access through government programs in both US and Europe and around the world. Uh, knowledge is hard. And so the, the change in the culture is hard. But again, we made advances. So I think personally that so there is Linux operating system, there is a Linux foundation and Apache Foundation, and these organizations lead the way to bring people together, right? So for instance, Automotive Linux brought together Companies as far as Toyota, which are, which are loath to share, but they have to share to create some OSS for cars because they're not a car company. Same thing needs to happen for science. And I humbly offer that one of the vehicles should be our initiative called Open Source Science, which basically is a community of scientists and engineers thinking together and sharing uh, data. And, uh, and I think Ernest's idea is great sharing parameters. This is something we know how to do. We can set up you know, shared uh, commons. The notion is called uh, Commons. There is an organization called ML Commons, which shares data for benchmarking machine learning algorithms. There is Kaggle, which shares data sets. So I think we need to take this model. We need to see how community shares uh, these data sets. For, and there is a therapeutic data commons. So we have best practices, we have examples. Let's take these examples. Let's study them in our interest groups and, le and let's implement them. I think, I think the road ahead is pretty exciting. It's pretty clear. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Alexi. All right. Um, so now let's have some questions. I know people have been eager to, to get started. So can we bring the microphone over? Okay, so let's start right there. <laughs> Ladies first. We have a cue. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, maybe as a start, I'm a great fan of open. I've 
published open data sets, I build open source technology. And one of the major shortcomings I've seen, I'll call it homogenization and monopolization. Um, and to give maybe three concrete examples, let's take Coursera courses. Once one really great course exists um, with a really great lecturer, why should we have any other courses on it? Um, I'll take maybe machine learning conferences. Once we've got particular benchmarks, everybody does research on the same benchmarks. Um, we even see it in conferences, critiquing conferences, other conferences with benchmarks. They still create their own benchmarks and use the same benchmarks. And maybe if we come to, let's say, the medical domain, we found that, um, for example, the shoulder joints of people of African descent are very different to the shoulder joints of people of Caucasian descent. And so in that sense, like diversity has seemed really important in evolution. And um, how do we think about diversity in the context of open? Okay, great, great question. Um, so does open just continue towards homogenization or uh, is it a way to incorporate a greater diversity and novelty and uh, you know everything uh, that we need to to solve these problems in full um, I may, maybe I'll start with with you um, yeah certainly you work in a similar problem context where uh, being uh, fair and complete you know with respect to uh, challenges in uh, life sciences are, are important so uh, let's hear your perspective I mean, there, there is definitely a value to diversity because, you know, we need to hear all differences of opinions. And, you know, we see that in Linux, right? How many flavors of Linux we have? But in the end, they are all using a kind of a base that can benefit from each other. And I think that's what is important. Like, you know, we need to capture coordination between groups. And like, because we know, for example, I work with other like modeling groups we do the same type of models and all those stuff but we do them very differently we call it each of our art is different but each of us gives some a different perspective but if we are doing it in a coordinated manner then we learn from each other and we can reuse like each other's derivative products to accelerate what we do and i think you know in a nutshell you know keep diversity but promote coordination <laughs> Okay, thank you. Er Ernesto, in your point of view, open Very and quick. diverse are at odds or? No, I think open and diverse are not at odds, but if I interpret the question correctly, is, is our properties like diversity that are, can be translated into something which has to do with the data or with the process of learning from the data? So, uh, okay, so I think that this is possible. And of course, I even know some people who tried partial answers to that. So, uh, but frankly speaking, uh, I think we will be able to verify, thanks to this type of common endeavor, uh, the, the emergence of this type of non-functional properties of the learning, like the, the degree of diversity, at least we will be able to observe it. And this is already something, you know, because the lack of diversity exists today, but it's difficult to estimate how much unless, until you have to, you try a model on the field that has been trained on a, some sort of a partial sample, and then you end up with the results which are very bad compared to the ones you would expect based on the papers, right? And then you understand that the reason was that, well, uh, the degradation of the performance is due to the lack of diversity, original lack of diversity on the training. So, okay. I think that uh, um, if we do it right, the, the notion of socializing the process of doing science may help us to observe at least these type of features, uh, meta features like diversity, diversity in the data, diversity in the models. So I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, you know, I don't know why, but maybe <laughs> I'm optimistic. We will be able to see at least. Yes. Okay. We have another question. So please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for this, such great insight. Uh, I'm Rohan. I'm a PhD student at Lund University in Sweden. I have a question. Uh, we understood from the discussion that openness and data sharing uh, could be a certain uh, concept of concern. And uh, in order to achieve openness, we need a certain uh, architecture uh, in order to uh, do it, as well as trying to preserve privacy and security at the same time. So this is this is like a two-way thing. So uh, I just want to know from uh, from the experts end that uh, where do you think that distributed ledger or blockchain uh, 
uh, fits into it, or whether even it has a place, or if it has a place, why it has a place. If it doesn't has a place, why it doesn't has a place? Because uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the concept of distributed ledger is like uh, first decentralization, immutability, and openness that anybody can check. At the same time, once things are there, you cannot immute or you cannot play with that. So, uh, I mean, my research evolves around that. So I'm just pretty interested to know from the <laughs> expert point of view. Thank you so much. Okay. So yeah, blockchain could have a role. Um, Ernesto, I saw you maybe wanting well, to say something. I, I am to plead you. guilty. I was the co-author <laughs> of a paper saying something like use of blockchain for federated learning, you know? So uh, yeah, so I have to plead guilty now. I cannot say no, no. So uh, everybody, but uh, let me say this. Of course, uh, the notion that uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, open platforms where uh, the platform access may be regulated, but basically it has to be a, a peer to peer community. And uh, the data items that define the models, uh, both uh, uh, the, uh, at the learning stage and later as parameters, well, those are contributed. Is there a, so I believe you, I would, you should rephrase your question like this. Is there a role for community consensus in the validation of the model parameters? So this is a first question, which is, in my opinion, uh, uh, preliminary with respect to whether the right technology is distributed ledger and which distributed ledger is best for this type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, to, to create the context for this. So the first question is, yes, I believe that in some cases, in some cases, the distributed co uh, consensus problem is uh, 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 the problem of having reliable, uh, shareable information can be handled as a distributed consensus problem. So, plead guilty, I wrote the paper, I can't uh, say. Secondly, is blockchain the right place where to do it? Which blockchain? Open, close, vertical, for every, uh, distinct one for each different community? I frankly don't know. Uh, one thing is that uh, the big problem I see is that the blockchain property as a, 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 an abstract solution are one thing, and the blockchain property as a software implementation are another. So uh, in both cases, we have to, to check whether we actually have the implementations that could uh, handle that problem. Sorry, I stop here. Okay, thank you. So I think I will ask one more question, and then um, we will have one concluding question for me, for each of the panelists. So yes, but you do need a microphone. So in the world of open science, um, what could IEEE and Computer Society do beyond just bringing you here for the panel? And what they don't already do today. And if I think about what they do today are primary three things. Uh, you, you would think it's papers, conferences, and standards, but it's really curating the content, congregating people, and then reaching consensus. Now, I formulated the question using IEEE and Computer Society, but you can remove all of these, the question is really, what do you guys need that doesn't exist today? Okay, great, great question. Um, so the panelists have heard the, the question, I assume. Alexei, how about you? Yeah, you first of all, I think uh, Ernesto really hit the nail on the head again with community validation. So this is something uh, we've been thinking about uh, regarding large language models, right? Because they can generate gibberish, right? They can generate meaningful text. And so people who think about using things like GPT-3 for, for science discovery, they really need to run the output by, um, by some experts. So I think what we need to do, we need to establish this uh, expert in the loop infrastructure where we'll be able to validate all kinds of results come from automated systems or hybrid systems where AI is a part, right? Because we ultimately, the judgment is with the humans. No matter what AI will bring, we need to judge. So I think uh, the professional societies are a natural mechanism for curating knowledge and establishing authority. And it's not going away any time ever because we need to trust humans to make sound decisions. So I think uh, the role will only strengthen because now we need to basically have hierarchical technological structures that you can route knowledge to an expert to quickly get the judgment. And the expert knowledge, expert time is very valuable, right? So I'm kind of envisioning the system where you know, it even may be paid, right? Like in 10 minutes, you can judge a bunch of decisions and make money based on your kind of, kind of expertise. And we need to build structures which will route these decisions 
to the right experts. And so the uh, and the, the professional societies will always uh, uh, keep the place of kind of being the arbiters of who really is an expert in the field or not, right? This is not going away. Okay. Ahmed? Uh, I think you're muted. The society is like has a role of like trying experimentation, actually doing social experiments, because I think the solutions that we get are not guaranteed to work immediately. Right. We need to try different things and how how much openness is needed versus what kind of like openness, you know, can be like more, you know, seamlessly integrated into care. But I should also note that I triple E already did those kind of experiments like we did that with the engineering in medicine and biology society and we actually the paper that i was alluding to like when we actually asked people to disseminate their models like as with their paper and then the reviewers will try to run that models and report their experiences and i triple the transactions of biomedical engineering study and that was a good opportunity for us to explore what is the even burden of it like or like you know what are the experiences of people so okay thank you uh, Ahmed uh, Ernesto what do we need from IEEE or some well, similar this organizations this is a hard question but again so sorry I, I once again I want to finish with I agree with everything that was said I would like to add one thing that was maybe implied but I want to make it explicit the value of the scientific work is being useful to others in a, so a part of its value, at least a, a big part of its value, being part, being to me is a measure of compositionality. Of course, we have citations, and the, the professional societies already do a very good job in creating the network and maintaining the network by which the works reference each other and whatever. But we need a little bit more. We need a little bit more, especially because the work is not the written word; is in many cases the written word plus data plus the procedure plus the process and being able to verify and to favor the positionality, meaning the reuse of the research work that is in a paper by, by others. And so they also provides a nice measure of how useful it is, which is better than just counting how many times the citation. So I think that the professional society could drive a little bit in that direction, sort of GitHub uh, type of, of approach. I think that we should try. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, th th thanks for all the questions. And I want to thank again the, the panelists. I think you've all done a great job in, in shedding light on the possibilities of, of open when it comes to uh, accelerating scientific discovery and also scaling it out and, and, and scaling it up for even bigger impacts. But I want to just ask a final question from, from the panelists. And it's really asking you to make a prediction here or, or forecast. And basically the question... Uh, I have is within the next five years, will there be a significant scientific discovery that comes through open? And when I say open, I mean everything that we've been talking about, okay? Open data, open models, open infrastructure, open challenges. So yeah, so please answer with a yes or no. And um, if you have a, an idea of what one of them may be, uh, you know, that would be great too. So Ahmed, why don't we start with you? Uh, I will say yes. And I think there are already initiatives like both in the funding agencies, like in the United States and in Europe to really, you know, essentially betting on that promise, right? And so that like creating data, like all of us at NIH, because I think we will be, as we, you know, coordinate and, create data in a more concerted effort in multiple sites, we will have a better chance of understanding disease and discovering interventions. Okay, so we have one yes. Alexi, how about you? Uh, I'll add a yes and I will add a data point, right? So COVID-19, we came to the vaccine in a much faster way than before. And if you look what the community did, there were multiple initiatives, I think, which, which helped a lot. Right, there were uh, every like if you look, there were COVID conferences where everybody gave land the uh, uh, contribution. There were computational consortia, and I think there is basically it would not be possible already without the data available to the companies. And if you look at the companies, the like Moderna, which are funded by governments and private 
capital, right? So there, there is private public partnership in place. So I think uh, given the funding and direction, there will be major medical breakthroughs. I think some kind of cancers will become treatable, which were not. New materials will be found. And I think we'll make significant progress in, in climate change sustainability by modeling it at a scale. So I think there's three directions. I, I think there will be advances in each of them and possibly major breakthroughs. Okay, so we have two yeses. Ernesto, no pressure. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I will join the others. Yes, uh, but also because I hope so. <laughs> Strongly <laughs> hope so. Because there are some problems that cannot be avoided. And one was mentioned by Alessandro, carbon capture. This, there are some problems that I don't think are in the scope of traditional. So we really need to hope and to... And so I believe that it's not wishful thinking. It's the optimism of will. <laughs> we, we need to make it work because with the, some problems we won't be able to solve otherwise. This is just my... Okay, so we must, and where there's a will, there's a way. Okay, and open is the way. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I think on that note, we will conclude the panel. I want to thank all of you for attending today. And, um, you know, of course, thank all of our panelists. So thank you very much. Pleasure.